I'm going to place our agenda in the chat right now so that everyone can see where we are in um, in our process here. Um, and we're, again, really excited for everyone um, to have joined. Um, first, I want to start with a land acknowledgement and um, just a terminology level setting. So racism in our city, as in the rest of America, is baked into our institutions, society, and cultural norms. Since the 17th century, financial gains from the displacement of the Lenape and other indigenous people and the forced labor of enslaved Africans were foundational to the city's prosperity. Discrimination and violence against marginalized groups is a part of our city's past, but it need not be the story of our future. I just wanted to quickly explain some terminology used. Uh, so throughout our presentation, we will use the acronym BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. We will name Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian, Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, and all people of color whenever possible. We will uh, we do understand that each group is diverse and has varied historical and current experiences with racial inequality. Now, let's begin. We're going to start with Harold Miller, the Deputy Executive Director for External Affairs. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great uh, that you have joined us uh, this afternoon. And uh, the Racial Justice Commission is extremely uh, happy to have all of you here today. Uh, it's um, our pleasure to share what we have uh, uh, heard thus far from uh, all of you who have participated and uh, thousands of New Yorkers who have gave us input thus far. And so today I just want to uh, you know, let you know that we are joined, uh, joining you, the Racial Justice Commission staff uh, to walk you through our uh, NYC racial, racial justice an interim report from us, uh, the commission staff. This report is the foundation of our in public engagement um, through our next several weeks, which we'll dis discuss a little bit later. Uh, today's presentation format will incorporate mostly screen shares and the actual report and the website. You can uh, best navigate uh, these app, um, items. Uh, so I'm joined by my colleagues, as you already heard, uh, you know, Rachel. I also have Melanie Ash, our general counsel, Jimmy Pan, our policy director and special counsel, Sam Stanton, senior policy advisor, legal counsel, Rachel, and uh, Rachel Cato, I already said, is our chief of operations. And so uh, we all are uh, ha more than happy to have you here. And uh, we'll begin, and I'm going to turn it over to Melanie Ash, our general counsel. Thank you very much, Harold, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Melanie Ash, and as Harold said, I'm the general counsel for the Racial Justice Commission, and I use she, her pronouns. I am going to briefly share a little bit about the Ch Racial Justice Commission and who we are and our goals. Just by way of background to introduce you to um, to the organization, and then we'll move on to some other information about the report. So in March 2021, the New York City Racial Justice Commission was formed by the mayor. Sorry, just a second here. I think we're now seeing, I think, a full screen of the website. So we're going to be walking you through that. Um, so in March 2021, the commission was formed by the mayor to identify and root out structural racism in the policies and procedures that govern our city. We, that is the staff, many of whom you're, you're meeting today, um, as along with the 11 appointed commissioners, are simultaneously both a charter revision commission and a racial justice commission. What that really means is that as a charter revision commission, we have the legal authority to change the New York City Charter. And on the website, you can see there is a tab with information about the charter uh, pointed out here is what is the charter, which you can scroll through to get a better understanding of the types of things that the charter relates to. But by way of a brief overview, the New York City Charter, which is essentially the city's constitution, defines the organization, the powers, the functions, and the essential procedures of city government, from elected officials to the budgeting process, it sets out the structures for all the different agencies um, and it generally gives a, the, the foundation, the framework for how the city operates. And while the New York City Charter essentially provides an important roadmap that guides all aspects of government services, it does not on its own ensure equity or fairness in the design or delivery of those services. 
I would encourage you to visit our website, nyc.gov forward slash racial justice to learn more about the charter and to discover how the city is governed and how that affects you as a New Yorker. So now we're going to the about section of the website and we're gonna be looking at the timeline and the process section. In short, uh, since the time that the commission was named, we've been working towards our final goal, which is to put forward ballot proposals that will structurally change the charter in a way that will further racial justice and equity. And we are relying on the public to help inform how we get to those proposals. Ultimately, New York City voters are the ones who will decide if the ballot proposals that are put forward to advance racial equity become law. And those ballot proposals will be on the ballot in the November 2022 election. And I'd like to turn it over now to our policy director, Jimmy Pan, to take you through the next part of this, pro of this presentation. Thank you, here's Jimmy. Hey, Ollie, thanks. Hi, everyone, I'm Jimmy, and my pronouns are he, him, as mentioned before. I'm on the policy team here at the commission. I'm really glad to share with you today some of what we've been working on. You know, as a start, you can access our report on the page that was just on screen. I'll just repeat that for you again, nyc.gov slash racial justice. You know, the homepage of that site includes links to access the report. We're gonna pull that up for you right now so you can see where to read and download it. You can find it in the What We've Heard tab, which we're showing you right now. And these green links here are where you can download an executive summary or download the full report. So quickly, this report is a, an update from the commission staff. It's an interim report. You know, the, in this report, we are not setting out to show what the commission is going to put forward to voters for election next year. Um, but instead, what we're doing is recapping for New Yorkers what we've heard as we've engaged the community for the past few months. We've had hundreds of people come to us to tell the commission how structural racism has impacted their lives, what changes we should make to the charter, and how we might do that. So again, this is to illustrate for you what we've heard is happening in the city from New Yorkers themselves. And the report also shows readers like you how you can become involved in the next steps in the process to suggest revisions to the charter that are aimed at advancing racial equity. So I'm gonna go through some key takeaways that you can see in our executive summary. Here's just some basic background about the commission and inside the report, it talks about the six takeaways that we took from the public engagement, which are the six patterns of inequities that we've identified. Sam, senior policy advisor, will run through them in a second, but just so you all know, the reason that we decided to organize these patterns of inequities is because, of course, we heard hundreds of issues from New Yorkers, many of which, if not all, we've known about for a long time. But since we are aiming to make structural changes to the charter, we need to figure out what is at the root of these hundreds of issues and how can we start addressing areas of inequality and inequities. And so by organizing them this way, we can start to have a framework to think about these issues and to start to design proposals that directly get at these patterns. And again, Sam will talk about them in a second. You know, in our report, we also lay out our criteria for how we're gonna select proposals. We can't put on the ballot you know, hundreds of measures, even if we want to and think they're necessary. Instead, we're gonna to aim to create the boldest, broadest long-term changes that impact the root causes and start to dismantle structural racism. So we're not getting at the symptom, we're getting at what is causing these issues to come up. So some examples of structural change might be changes that transform how government uses power or makes decisions. It could be a change that 
redefines the relationship between government and society. You know, structural changes should eliminate contradictions between the values that we hold as New Yorkers, such as racial justice, and government structures that are serving to undermine those values. So making sure that what we're actually doing in government is consistent with our fundamental values. And also looking at our charter and seeing if there it reflects outdated values that do not honor our current multiracial democratic reality. And you know, targeting our changes towards those outdated values or reversing those values specifically. And finally, our report mentions, you know, what you as New Yorkers can expect uh, between now and December. Again, we're going to have a manageable number of high impact ballot proposals to revise the charter itself. In thinking about how we might set forth what our foundational values are and have a unifying vision of that, we're aiming to propose a preamble to the charter that would establish those values and guide uh, how government serves New Yorkers. Finally, we're aiming to produce a racial justice roadmap that includes recommendations beyond charter revision, such as ideas for city, state, and federal lawmakers, because not everything we want to do is going to make it onto the ballot, and there are many things that we can't do. So we want to make sure that we're setting forth a path for that to continue even after this commission. So thank you for joining, and we look forward to partnering with you all. I'll turn it over to Sam. Hey, y'all. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Stanton. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the senior policy advisor and legal counsel with the Racial Justice Commission. Thanks, y'all, for hopping on this afternoon. Uh, I think now we're going to check out our website um, at the What We've Heard tab. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all are going to share that, but I'm going to go through the six patterns of inequity that Jimmy just mentioned, um, and just for y'all's awareness, it's also on our website, which is really cool and jazzy, and y'all should check it out. Uh, so the Racial Justice Commission will prioritize and pursue proposals to address the root cause of these patterns. So as Jimmy just mentioned, we identify these patterns based on what community thought leaders, advocates have talked to us about. These are a lot of the reoccurring themes that we've heard. Uh, and so I'm just going to walk through the different ones. And what we're really interested in doing is sort of grasping at the root of why do these inequities exist in our city and what are things that we can do to, to make meaningful interventions in, in these patterns and disrupt uh, those patterns from showing up across our city. Uh, so the, the six areas are inequity and quality services that promote social and emotional well-being inequity in work advancement and wealth building, inequity within and across neighborhoods that inhibits thriving individuals, families, and communities, marginalization and over-criminalization of BIPOC persons and communities, inequity in representation and decision-making, and last but not least, enforcement and accountability of government and entities. Uh, and so I'm gonna walk through each one a little bit with some examples. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of what we're talking about when we name each. So inequity and quality services, we heard consistently that even when services exist, they may not be accessible or reachable uh, for BIPOC New Yorkers, even in meeting basic needs such as quality education, safe and secure housing, health and mental health services. Uh, and, and ultimately we found this to be uh, deprivation of resources to BIPOC communities, that even where people can get services, there are barriers there that make it very difficult for BIPOC New Yorkers, people of color, immigrants, to actually access those services, right? So as part of that could be these race neutral criteria sometimes in applying for something or in reaching something. It could be a lack of language access. Uh, and we've heard many of those services and programs, are, and as I mentioned, are designed or access in a race neutral manner um, from school screens to job criteria uh, that block folks. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, but basically what we're saying is that we've noticed that we've heard over and over from folks that there's inequities in how people are able to reach things and get things to meet their basic needs on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's interacting with government or trying to access basic services. 
The next one we have on our list is inequity in work advancement and wealth building. Uh, and I think most folks are familiar with the racial wealth gap that has accumulated over centuries um, and has resulted in a dramatic gap between the wealth of white families and, and black families in particular. Uh, and we've heard a lot about uh, racial equity and the need to, to build wealth and the need to address the racial wealth gap. Uh, and then we can't talk about racial equity without addressing issues of capital and other monetary resources. Um, we heard about uh, procurement, city contracting, uh, and how businesses owned by people of color, workers of color um, are systematically underpaid or undervalued um, through these processes by design. Uh, and in particular, this has had a, a disparate impact on women and, and immigrants as well. Third, uh, inequity within and across neighborhoods. So one thing we're talking about when we say that is why are certain neighborhoods well-resourced and others not? Why are some neighborhoods feel safer than others? Why do some neighborhoods have better schools than others? Or why are some neighborhoods over-policed? Uh, and we hear consistently there's a place-based pattern to how inequities are traced in our city, that resources are not distributed fairly across neighborhoods, and that burdens or responsibilities, such as where waste stations are, are concentrated, for example, are not distributed equitably or even equally as neighborhoods of color are, tend to be overburdened. Uh, and we heard many New Yorkers voice, voice that they would like racial equity prioritized in decisions around land use, public space, public land, and would like more opportunities for community or collective ownership. Next, uh, another pattern that we heard a lot, and I think this may be what comes to people's minds first time when they think about racial justice, is marginalization over criminalization. Uh, we heard that our system of safety prioritizes punishment, arrests, and incarceration over providing support and healing, especially for our BIPOC communities. New Yorkers propose reimagining public safety as a supports communities need to thrive, meaning a carceral response or punishment response to everything doesn't actually provide our communities with the public safety that they need, right? And that public safety actually means a lot more than policing. Uh, and while we heard much about criminal justice and police reform, we heard that criminalization goes beyond policing to other aspects of government services, including surveillance and other forms of marginalization. So we're not solely focused on police reform, we're focused, we're thinking at the root causes of why communities are over-criminalized and why over-policing has not made anyone feel safer. Uh, and next, inequity and representation in decision-making. So when we're talking about representation and decision-making, we're talking about who in government gets to make decisions, who gets to make these policy decisions. Uh, and we're talking about both city officials and city workers. We are many New Yorkers testify in favor of giving communities and BIPOC communities in particular, greater power in government decision-making and that existing official channels of civic participation don't work well enough. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, we heard about a failure to prioritize racial equity in city decision-making. While many advances have been made to center equity in the city's goals and track progress, many speakers think consideration of race-based harms or benefits should be required for every major decision facing all branches of government. So when we say that, we mean we can't just have the status quo um, and that, that racial equity that we've heard from folks is that racial equity should be a factor or a guide in, in how we make decisions uh, to make sure that we're not exacerbating disparities. And last, um, enforcement and accountability of government and entities. Uh, as an overarching theme across all of these patterns, uh, we heard about enforcement and accountability. And when I say enforcement and accountability, I'm talking about it, the city government being able to hold itself accountable uh, for racial justice. We're talking about how do we make sure that 
things that we want that we want to see and that we want to make sure happen actually can happen and that there are consequences uh, and and what that could look like so our laws must be strong not only in intent but also application we heard that laws to protect against racial discrimination don't work well enough um, across different sectors and especially when oversight agencies lack authority or enforcement tools that was another pattern we saw a lot is that many of our agencies tasked with accountability don't always have the tools that they need to carry their job out effectively. Um, so each pattern of inequity in the report includes Akita, the commission and staff for unpacking what we heard as we move towards solutions. So this is sort of a, a summary of the different patterns that we heard and it's informing our thinking on what are the best ways to tailor interventions that grasp at the roots of these inequities. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Harold. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so I, as uh, Jimmy and Sam laid out uh, there, you know, uh, our report uh, consists of what we have heard from uh, the public and heard um, over a period of time. Uh, and uh, these inequity buckets, um, you know, lay the foundation of uh, where we want to go moving forward. Um, I failed at the top for those who are like, listening on the phone or can't see my, uh, my box that my pronouns is he and him his uh so uh so those are my pronouns uh so for those who are listening on the phone uh those are um, my uh, pronouns uh so you know this uh gives us opportunity to um go into the public engagement opportunities uh, between now through december and as i mentioned at the start um uh that this report will be the foundation of our engagement uh, moving forward and the patterns will be a starting point for our conversations and engaging with folks you know, to give us feedback and um, help influence what uh, the charter will look like. Um, and, you know, the two questions that, you know, we're gonna ask all New Yorkers is uh, do these patterns in equity reflect the lived experience of black indigenous people of color in New York? And what solutions can stop, prevent or address these patterns? Uh, so those are the two center questions that we are looking uh, for uh, folks to talk about. And so ways people can get involved. There's many ways that you can get involved in our process. I'm gonna highlight some um, in, uh, right now, is that online. You notice that the online version and the PDF version uh, download of uh, the report, both include questions. You can also read the um, patterns and equity and respond directly on the page and complete the online form. Uh, we're gonna have a series of public input sessions um, towards the end of this month and through the month of November, where we're going to go, um, you know, to the different communities around the city and listen to uh, what people have to say in reaction to the report, as well as uh, answer those two questions um, in the ways uh, of their experiences and capabilities of the solutions that they come up with. And then also we have a digital toolkit where you can engage with us, um, a, you know, digitally um, on our social media channels as well as help you know, spread the word to uh, your networks and neighbors uh, and alike. The resources available, the website is our best tool uh, to engage with the commission and learn uh, what the latest is happening. Uh, we're gonna have translated documents. Um, you know, if there's something that's not in the language of preference, you, you can always uh, send us a request and we can work on again, those um, languages uh, translated for you. And then the additional opportunity to engage, um, I know there may be some faith leaders um, on the line. We're gonna have a weekend of faith um, uh, around the weekend of November 5th, uh, where we wanna engage houses of worship across the city uh, to talk about the Racial Justice Commission. Uh, we're also working with various community um, organizations through our various partners to host focus groups. And so if you have an organization, um, a member-based organization uh, that uh, can benefit um, or we can benefit from uh, their input, uh, please let us know. And then we would love to uh, set up something where we can um, have a focus group or uh, a dialogue with your organization. And the commission staff is um, speaking at community meetings. Uh, so if you're having existing meetings um, in your organization or your network is getting together, uh, you more than, um, more than welcome to reach out to us um, at our email, which is racialjustice at charter.nyc.gov. That's racial justice at charter.nyc.gov. And so with that, you know, we're gonna um, open it up for um, uh, question and answers for the next few minutes. 
And I'm gonna have uh, Rachel uh, facilitate that. Rachel. I was not um, unmuted. Okay, thanks, Harold. So we are going to take an opportunity right now to open up the floor for any questions that are available that are um, that you may have about our commission, our work, um, any upcoming events, um, uh, or anything in, in that in that vein. Um, so I'm looking at the chat. If you do have any specific questions, please put them there, and then I'll reach out to our staff to see um, who is available to answer. So I do notice from Sarah Cisco. Um, she was asking, how do houses of worship get involved if they are interested? I'll take that one. Uh, so houses of worship um, can email the Racial Justice Commission um, email box um, uh, that I just mentioned, as, uh, and we'll put that in the chat as well, uh, racialjustice at charter.nyc.gov. Um, and we're uh, more than happy to reach out uh, to, that, uh, to you and to the house of worship uh, to get involved. Uh, so uh, thank you for that question. Okay, and next up we have, what is the deadline for inputs from uh, Santa Soriano? And I think I can Steph's gonna here. answer that one. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, oh, the, sure, I'll take a stab. You know, I think folks should get in their input as soon as they can. You know, we certainly have been working through the input that people have already provided and the staff are researching ideas as we speak. And so, you know, our deadline to submit to the clerk is in December. So if you just work backwards a little bit, you can think that, you know, any ideas you have, you should try to get to us by early November so that we can research and, and flesh it out and make sure that we're doing a thoughtful job. We're looking forward to people's ideas. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, and then just as a jump to jump on that, as a reminder that um, you can also share your ideas via uh, the website. So you can go to the um, get involved, I believe, section, and you can see exactly where you're able to do your online, submit an online written testimony. And then you can also come to one of our public input sessions. We have two coming up in November. And then we also have um, a virtual session. So we have two in-person sessions, two virtual sessions, and other commission meetings that you're able to join as well. So please check out our events section on the page so you can see how you can join. And I've also uh, added a link here. Um, for you guys to, to take a look there. We also have a couple of other questions. Um, I wanted to address, uh, Eugene Falak had a couple of questions here, some of which were already addressed, but there were two, um, two uh, statements that you made, Eugene, regarding some suggestions that you made, one about the Civic Association and how everyone wants more police officers. That's a great suggestion that you can give to us in the public input, I'm sorry, in the um, input form. And again, that will help to inform our um, measures going forward. And then I did want to address something that was um, that you that you questioned before, Eugene, which was, does the staff and commission listen, or are the results foreordained? And I would love for one of our staff members to, um, one of the commission staff, to address that. Happy to jump in again. We had hundreds of leaders come and testify. We had thousands of minutes of public testimony. And we certainly took our notes on all of that. You know, what we knew many issues going forward that people raised up, but what we didn't know going in was how we should best think about them. And so when we hear about these patterns repeatedly and hear about the ways New Yorkers have spoken about them, it helps us identify what's the linkage between those things. You know, I think we all know that in the city, things are very interconnected. If you don't have good health, it's hard to succeed in school. If you don't have good housing, it's hard to thrive in your neighborhood or feel safe. And so these are things that we know as, as people who have been in the policy world and the commissioners have been working on these issues for decades. So they're aware of the issues, but what we really tried hard to do as we listened to folks speak to us is identify what's, what's at the root of all this. 
and what are the structures that are involved and how can we put forward ideas and changes that would speak to those things broadly. And the, inter the interim report allows you to see how we're trying to do that. It shows our homework. But again, we're asking you all to continue to give us feedback on that. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so we have another question from um, Akila. And it says, does the new mayoral administration have any power to stop the final proposals for going forward or creating new proposals? I, I can uh, answer that question. Thank you for the question. Um, the, the Racial Justice Commission was appointed by the current mayor, um, but we are uh, an independent um, commission, so it, not under the mayoral control. Um, and as described in the report and in, in the presentation today, the proposals will go forward in December prior to the start of the new administration. So the proposals in the ballot as ballot measures will, will have been submitted to the clerk prior to any future mayor taking office. And so a future mayor could not interfere with or change those ballot proposals, uh, which will be put forward obviously by this independent commission. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Akila. And Sarah, I believe, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Santa, we missed another one of your, or Sarah's question, sorry. Um, it says, are we, are you working with and across city agencies to operationalize these recommendations? And is there a plan to do that? Take this one. We are certainly hearing from agencies already about some ideas to make changes to the charter. And we're trying to think about how that fits into the patterns of inequities we've heard. And you know, if there are structural changes, you know, how we might operationalize them. If they're not structural changes, how we might follow that, you know, follow it down into the roots of the charter. And you know, to the extent that we're trying to solve a particular issue, we're certainly reaching out to those agencies to get at them. And we're trying to figure out who at the agencies would help us think through some of the, the trickier issues. We know that some of the things that we're trying to do, like measure things, budget for things, enforce things, those are really nuanced actions that you want to know how they'll actually play out in government. And so while the commission staff are all government experts, we also do want to talk to people who are in agencies and get their perspective on how it would best play out. Um, and so, you know, in terms of a plan to do that, we we had opened it up to agencies in the same way that we had opened it up to the public to give us ideas. But for those who submit ideas we want to follow up on, we'll reach out to them directly. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, we have another question from Santa about um, health equity. She says, the preliminary report doesn't seem to have much on health equity other than mental health. If that's the case, can you talk about the input uh, the commission received on this area? Yeah, it's a good observation. You know, we we did hear a lot about mental health directly. I think, especially the effect of the pandemic has really brought mental health on top of people's minds. Especially, folks in Black communities came to us and said it's been really important to think about and address. We did hear from folks on health equity, and some of the, the ways we did mention it in the report actually speak directly to how we heard about it. You know, they spoke to us about how they would try to hire folks from communities of color to be able to provide health services in a way that's responsive and respectful of different cultures, but that there may be barriers in city processes that make it harder for them to hire those very folks. And so we're chasing down those barriers and figuring out, you know, what can we do across the board to make sure that we aren't blocking off access to quality health services. Sam, did you want to add something to that? No, I guess the only thing I would add to that is we had a uh, panel event specifically on health and health inequities. Um, and another way that is manifested is how certain waste facilities are concentrated in communities or how certain burdens are concentrated in communities that exacerbate 
health inequities, um, in addition to lack of access to services. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we heard our health leaders talk to us about being able to measure health accurately, being able to step in at the preventative stage, you know, whether that's direct physical health or the more environmental kind of health that Sam is mentioning. You know, do we have the tools in government to really get at the root of all of these health disparities? And so we mentioned them in conjunction with the other quality services that we noticed are not always available in an equitable way. And some of the processes that we might need to change to improve health might be the same sort of processes that we need to improve health services across the board. Thank you, Jimmy and Sam. Uh, for Mary Rinaldi, she asks, uh, they ask with respect to the proposals, um, will the committee put forward, or that, sorry, let's see. What, sorry, so with respect to the proposals um, that are being put forward based on the feedback and ideas from New Yorkers, what kind of process will these proposals go through uh, with the public and community before being added to the ballot? Yeah, so um, with that, we want to make sure that um, input that is received between now and uh, through November uh, is um, listened to and observed by our commission, uh, the commissioners uh, who would uh, then uh, synthesize that information with the commission staff uh, led by Jimmy and Sam and um, you know, see where uh, it can work with um, respect to our um, ballot proposals. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, uh, like Jimmy said earlier, uh, this is a time now to uh, give input uh, to, um, you know, especially uh, using uh, the six inequity um, uh, patterns um, as a basis uh, to um, uh, lay out a, uh, your vision or your idea or your solution uh, that should be considered, um, you know, by uh, the commission, um, the commissioners. Um, to put on the ballot. I don't know, Jimmy, if you want to add um, further, or Sam. No, I think you've done a good job of that. You know, part of, part of what we've done here in the commission is really front load hearing from people. You know, I think a lot of commissions, they may have a little more time to receive feedback on the proposals themselves, but, you know, here we try to make sure that how we're approaching this is to hear the issues from people first so that what we're even putting forward for feedback does embody you know, the, the concerns that people felt were at the top of their list. And so we're deep into research now and, and trying to make sure that there is time for feedback and there'll be a year before people vote on these things. So there'll be plenty of time to have discussion about them and to think about them, and which is what we want. We want people to think about what their fundamental values are and what government should be. And hopefully these changes sh will reflect that. Uh, but either way, we'll have a very thoughtful conversation about it. Great, thank you, Harold and Jimmy. Uh, just a couple more questions um, from Io Harrington, uh, who is the co-chair of Two City City Disaster Preparedness and Long-Term Recovery Groups. Um, they would like to know, or. It, to have a focus group or conversation about structural racism in disaster response. I think that's a great idea, um, especially uh, given with uh, the recent storm of um, the remnants of Hurricane Ida uh, that hit us in New York and where you had uh, 13 New Yorkers and I believe all were of color um, uh, that died. Uh, so i love to follow up with um, uh, with you and uh, figure out ways how we can put something together uh, to make sure that uh, that is a look, looked at by our commissioners. Great, thank you, Harold. Um, and then from Karen, uh, she says, what, uh, sorry, I guess, was there anything, sorry, I came through, uh, that surprised, any information that surprised um, the commissioners or the commission that came through? Any feedback? You know, one thing that struck me in particular, I'm not speaking for the commission as a whole, 
but I think that we weren't sure how much people would feel about, you know, how strongly they would think that the charter could affect their lives. And I think for some people, they, they wanted to just speak about the issues, but for others, they really recognize that, you know, what's in the charter does lay out how government works. You know, obviously the, the people in government have a role to play in that too, but they, a lot of New Yorkers did identify that our values, our rules, you know, the foundation of government comes from that document. And many New Yorkers told us specifically that they couldn't wait to see this document changed. And so we weren't sure if, if people were going to make that connection and that link. Um, but at least some of the folks who came out to our input sessions really came out strong for that. So I think that made us really happy to see that people could see the transformative power of, of this effort. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, we have two questions from Isaac Ray, so we'll take one at a time. One is, is there an estimated timeline or an idea for how long it will take to implement the changes that the commission plans to make? Try to answer that, but anyone should feel free to jump in here. You know, I think we are trying to do a balance between short-term and long-term changes. Some changes people will feel an effect right away, but other changes will be more about, you know, restructuring government to work better for all people, right? So that may take some time year over year, but what we're trying to set out here is to make sure that in the, in the coming decades that government reflects the things you want to see. Uh, not all communities have felt that way. You know, many communities have told us that they don't feel represented. They don't feel they have a, have a role in decision-making. They don't feel like government is responsive to their needs. And so those things do take time. You know, we're trying to steer, totally steer the ship in a different direction. And I think that's the reality of change is that there are a lot of great groups working on things that will take place immediately. And I think what we're trying to do, you should feel the effect soon, but like in full, they may take a while. I don't know if you all feel like that's a fair representation. I think that sounds very fair and balanced. Um, um, Isaac also asked uh, or mentioned that with the rise of the Asian American hate crimes in the city after the pandemic, can we speak uh, a little a bit on measures to improve the current anti Asian sentiment in the city. And that was actually the anti-Asian sentiment was something that we'd felt uh, or that we received feedback on in some of our, our surveys for sure. Yeah, I'll, I can try to take that um, you know, partly because I'm Asian, Asian American. But also, you know, it, it, it has come up quite a bit. You know, obviously communities feel concerned and I think, you know, the truth is we heard from a lot of people that they feel unsafe in many communities. I mean, you know, I think the Asian, anti-Asian American sentiment kind of brings to light that no community of color is feeling safe in New York City at all times, right? I think some communities feel like they want more police. Some communities feel like there's a lot of police there, but they still don't feel safe. And I think... Regardless, we heard a lot of communities feel marginalized. And so I think we're, we're trying to take in how communities are feeling now and thinking about what it is, what are we not doing to make communities feel safe? What are we not doing to make communities feel included? You know, why do communities continue to feel marginalized? Is it because we as a government aren't thinking about safety in the right way? And how might we do that so that all communities can feel just as safe? So uh, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't speak to whether the commission will specifically address anti-Asian hate, you know, but I, I can guarantee that we'll be looking at the issue in a, in a broad structural systematic way that should, you know, reduce the chance that any group will feel marginalized and hated in the decades to come. Thank you, Jimmy, for giving feedback on, on that. Um, we have about two more minutes. Uh, 
And so I think we can get one more question and there's one from Diane here. Um, and it says, again, thank you for taking uh, into account the testimonies of many people who feel strongly about the issues under the six patterns of inequity. And what happens to the proposals should groups of New Yorkers choose not to acknowledge those experiences? So I'm thinking, Diane, you're getting at what's gonna happen if, uh, if perhaps people don't vote those, you know, vote these measures in or, or, or what happens if they're not um, enforced, I assume, so that might be helpful to hear. Yeah, if I could take the first crack and then others jump in, please. You know, I, I, I actually like the way you framed it, Diane, in, in saying, what if people choose not to acknowledge those experiences? You know, one of the things that we heard a lot is that we're not always measuring people's experiences based on, you know, their specific ethnic background, based on what they're feeling in their communities. And so, you know, it's no surprise that there are people who may not acknowledge those experiences because maybe we haven't done a good job as government of collecting those experiences and showing, you know, the truth behind them. Part of what we're trying to do in, in this report and what we'll be doing in the final report is speaking their truths into reality and, and making it clear that we stand by what people feel, but also building those processes so that, you know, whether or not there are groups of New Yorkers who choose not to acknowledge those experiences, you know, we'll put that data out there. We'll put those experiences out there and we'll orient government to address them. You know, the question of whether people will vote for them or not is, is a totally separate thing, but of course it's always on our mind. We know that there are many people who might not buy into what their fellow New Yorkers feel on a day-to-day -day basis, on a decade-to-decade -decade basis. And that's unfortunate, but we are certainly having this discussion. I don't know if... if Melanie, if I, you yeah, from the legal perspective. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if something is not voted in, then it, it won't take effect. But I do think that the, the the value of this process, in addition to the ballot proposals, is the the engagement that we've had with New Yorkers, and the record of that engagement that this interim report presents. I also think, as Jimmy mentioned in his discussion. Um, that the report will include ballot measures, but it will also include other things, a roadmap for the future, uh, how the commission envisions that there, um, there, are, there are some things that can be done through the charter and there are other things that are not do not involve the charter or they're not within the city's control. So the commission is looking at all of those issues and is aware of that the, that the city's jurisdiction is limited to what it can do, do, what it can tackle under the law. But that doesn't mean it can't identify other issues for future uh, legislative bodies to take up um, and flag the issues for, for the federal, state, and local city government um, legislatures to, to take action on, because there are many things that can be done through other measures and other processes. So, well, obviously, we hope that, that the Commission will capture the hearts of New Yorkers and, and, and express and put forward ballot proposals that will that New Yorkers feel are, are valid and important and worth voting for. Um, and, and they'll, but there will also be other ideas and other proposals that are not specifically ballot measures in the final report. So those would not be, uh, there would still be an opportunity to advocate for those things, assuming that there was some of the ballot measures that didn't, that didn't pass. Thank you both for your feedback. Um, so we have, we're just about at time. There are a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to, but we will respond directly to those uh, via email. So please take a look in your email. Um, very interesting questions around what's going to happen after the commission has published the report, our, our report in December, um, what happens with this particular commission, et cetera. So we will uh, provide some more information. Um, uh, via email and respond to those questions. Thank you guys so much for joining. Any additional questions can be sent directly to our email inbox. Again, that's racialjustice at charter.nyc.gov, which will drop in the chat box now. And then if you have um, 
uh, any, again, interest in participating, um, sharing any information with your, uh, your community members, with your uh, colleagues, family and friends, uh, please do so. Like I said, we have quite a few events coming up between now and December, and we would love to see everyone to join and to bring, um, bring a friend if you can. Um, and uh, again, we appreciate everyone for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time and we hope you have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye.